it's great to see so many familiar names in the session. So glad that you could join us. And we are in store for a really fascinating session about this early college model, um, which I, so I'm really looking forward to learning more from our three presenters. So I'll start by presenting um, Dr. Julie Edmonds. She's a program director at the CERV Center at University of North Carolina at Greensboro. The CERV Center is a research and development organization doing research and supporting programs that remove educational barriers for K-12 students to access college. Um, that's that's one piece of it. There's a lot more, and um, she's going to explain it much better than I can. We also have Drew Ware joining us. He's the principal of Wake STEM Early College um, based in Raleigh, North Carolina. And then we also have Aaron Horn, who's the assistant dean for professional education and accreditation at North Carolina State University in Raleigh. So I'm going to pass the mic to Julie and welcome to everyone and welcome especially to our presenters. I'm so glad you're here and honored that you took the time to be with us today. So thank you so much. Julie? Susanna, thank you so much. Thank you so much for inviting us. It's a great um, opportunity to talk with a lot of folks who are really interested in this issue of expanding access and success in post-secondary education. So um, my newest title is actor, actually Director of the Early College Research Center, which is a new center established to do research on early college um, here at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. Um, I've been doing research on early college um, for about 17 years now, and um, much of it focused in North Carolina, but we've also done research um, across the country. So in Texas, Ohio, I'm, I'm actually in Indiana right now, um, where we've got a couple projects where there's a lot of early college work going on. So it's spread throughout the country, and we're excited to, to talk with you today. So I'm also delighted to present with two folks who are I am not presented with in the past. And um, so I'm thrilled to learn more um, from them as well. So Drew, you wanna introduce yourself? Um, so I'm, I'm Dr. Drew Ware. I am, as mentioned, the principal at Wake STEM uh, Early College High School. Um, I uh, got my start in the field of education as a kindergarten teacher. So I look like, uh, you know, what you think of when you think of kindergarten teacher, but um, <laughs> I've meandered my way all the way up through um, uh, and have finally made it to high school again. But um, uh, I've been at a Wake STEM for the last uh, three years um, and have uh, worked very closely with NC State um, and Dr. Horn there, um, uh, you know, providing opportunities for students um, who don't always have access to the same opportunities that um, other students have. And it, it's an incredible program. It's uh, it's uh, what we offer, what we provide both through the high school aspect of it, but then also the college aspect um, uh, really allows students uh, to uh, become ready for college in a way uh, that is real and um, we've seen the benefits of. So I'm really excited today to get to talk a little bit more about that with y'all. Great. And Dr. Horn. Yes. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Dr. Erin Horn. As they said, I'm the Assistant Dean for Professional Education and Accreditation in the College of Education at NC State University. Um, I have been in that role for approximately three years, but I have been on faculty at NC State for about 13 years. Um, I also come to this role by way of fourth grade. Um, so I was a former fourth grade teacher in Wake County Public Schools um, and then moved to the university to focus on um, high quality educator preparation. And I am coming to you today from actually um, in Washington, D.C., because we are meeting with legislators about the importance of high quality teacher preparation um, for the outcomes of our students um, in K-12 schools in the U.S. So um, I'm really excited to be here to talk to you about this partnership, I will say, I came on into this relationship um, after the partnership had the partnership was starting to be developed, um, and so some of the groundwork was already laid when I came into this relationship um, with Dr. Ware in the early college. Um, but it is a very important partnership for both our college as well as our university that we'll jump into a little bit later. So, yeah, well, we've got some elementary. I actually taught third grade in Durham Public yeah. Schools, so there, <laughs> there we go. We've got an elementary crew. Who's now? doing other things. So I'm going to share my screen now and let me make sure. Okay. Does that look okay? Everybody see the slides? Great. All right. Let me just get there. All right. 
So we're going to start with a bit of a poll because early college, even though it's spreading pretty rapidly, um, there's still a lot of people who don't know a lot about it. So um, Duncan, I think, can you launch the poll? There we go. So basically, what do you know about early college? So is this your first time hearing about it? Oh, we got a few people that don't know very much. Excellent. Some people have heard a little, heard a lot. Oh, we've got some folks who have heard, have implemented one or more. Oh, I've got some fellow researchers in the mix. Excellent. Okay. I'll give it just a minute or so. All right, so, so it appears, and this is very good information for our, my co-presenters here as well, that there's a lot of people who don't know as much about early college. So we will um, we'll try to be as, um, I don't wanna say basic, but, but cover some of the basics about early college. Um, but please, if, if there are things that are not clear, please feel free to put your questions in the chat. Um, and, and we will definitely respond. So here's the, there's the results. So we have a couple of people and the folks who, so we see have three respondents who are really pretty familiar with them. Um, feel free to jump in or share your experiences in the chat as well. Okay. So, um, let me just hang on. Let me just move my minimize. I just need to minimize my. Okay. Okay. Hang on for a second. I'm sorry. I'm having a little bit of trouble minimizing here. That's all right. We'll go ahead. So for today's presentation, we're going to begin by talking about the need for a model like early college. Um, so today's presentation is going to follow this, this structure here. So we're going to understand the case for merging high school and college, which is really the, what the early college model is. We're going to spend some time exploring what an early college looks like in practice. And then we're going to learn about the impacts of the early college model on students. Um, and then we're going to spend some time understanding early college implementation from the college side. And so Dr. Horn's going to share some information about that. And then I'd like us to consider the implications of early college and its learnings for your own work as well. So early colleges essentially represent an approach to schooling that merges high school and college. And so this presentation is going to start by making the case about why we might even want to think that this is a good idea. So there are a few things that I think we don't have to convince this audience of, but I'm going to remind you of them right now. So one is that we know that post-secondary education is vital for today's economy. We see statistics like about 80% of jobs today require some sort of post-secondary training. It doesn't have to be a four-year degree. It could be a two-year degree or technical credentials, but requires some sort of post-secondary training. We also know, and this is the reason I assume that many of you are here, that too many students struggle to enroll in and complete post-secondary education. And we also definitely know that certain populations have lower levels of access and success in college, including low-income students, first-generation students, and members of certain racial and ethnic groups. So what does this mean for us in the US? Basically, we have a recipe for a growing divide because we've got this increasing expectations for post-secondary degree, and we've really got some unequal distribution of post-secondary education. Um, and early college, um, kind of really takes this, this on head on. Um, so one of the reasons that we believe that there are problems here in terms of this unequal access and, and this unequal success is that there are these different systems. So, um, so what we see is that there are education, there are systems like K-12 systems, and then there's post-secondary systems. So our four-year institutions and our two-year institutions. And we know that there are barriers 
that, um, that these systems are not kind of perfectly aligned, that they, they're not always clear. And basically that there are many barriers that students can face as they, that keep students from being successful in post-secondary education. And that can include academic barriers. So there's misalignment often between the expectations of high school and the expectations of college. Um, there can be cultural barriers as well. Colleges and, and um, high schools operate very differently. Colleges definitely expect more independence and they often provide much less support for students. Um, just getting to college can be a problem. There are all these logistical barriers that students might face. Um, a researcher, um, Dan Klasik, um, coined this an application gauntlet in a really nice article that unpacks sort of all the things that students have to do in order to apply to college. And those, and if students don't, don't complete all those steps, they don't actually enroll. Um, and then there's huge financial barriers, as we know, um, because college at this point is considered optional. It really requires students um, to pay for it in many cases. And that, that cost can be definitely um, um, quite, uh, quite a burden and a barrier for many students. Um, so I'm going to stop and pause and ask people to think about this for a second. And so I want to ask you, so we're used to thinking about the secondary and the post-secondary education systems as being separate systems. And I want to ask you why you think that is. So if you have an idea, put it in the chat. Why do you think we have secondary, separate secondary and post-secondary systems? I'm going to pause for a minute, see if people can have some responses. Any thoughts about why we might have why we might have these separate systems? Money. <laughs> yeah, money is a big part. Maybe because secondary school is mandated by the government, higher ed's not. Yeah, sure. Capitalism. Maintain stratification and uphold systems of oppression. Yeah. College was not, is not thought to be necessary. Yeah. Yeah. So you all are already challenging the idea here that there needs to be two separate systems, right? So, um, Many policymakers actually kind of address that misalignment that we were talking about with the different systems by introducing like single individual policies that are intended to address each barrier. So those, so they might come up with a solution for the financial barriers, or they might address some of the academic barriers by modifying the graduation requirements for students, for example. Early college actually really takes a different approach. It basically says that we can address these barriers by combining the two systems. These two systems don't need to be separate. So basically these schools combine high school and college experiences so that they happen at the same time. So the schools that you're gonna hear about today, in these schools, students can earn a high school diploma and an associate degree or two years of, of transferable college credit at the same time. So when I first started studying these um, and I was presenting about them, I really talked about them kind of as this new innovative model. And then, um, and then when we were doing research for a book that we've just published this fall called Early College as a Model for Schooling, um, and really started looking at the history and realized that actually early college isn't an entirely new idea and that it actually really builds on a long history of this kind of work. Um, 
Um, so basically in the late 1800s, what we had um, was, was basically an extremely fluid line between post-secondary education and college. Um, there were even some colleges that had their own high schools um, designed to prepare students for them. Um, some prominent educators at the time were worried about this overlap between the last two years of high school and the first two years of college. So David Starr Jordan, who was the um, president of Stanford at the time, believed essentially that the last two years of college and the first and uh, last two years of high school and the first two years of college were essentially the same thing. The president of the University of Chicago agreed, and he worked with the local school district, Joliet in Joliet, Illinois. Um, to create what they called a junior college. And this was basically part of the high school and it extended the high school year by two years. Um, so it went from nine to 12 to a nine to 14 school. And the idea here was that more students could have access to some college and that when students came to the university, they'd be ready for advanced study. And then there was a similar approach that was used by um, in California called the Pasadena model. Um, and basically this was called the 644 model. And under this model, students would attend elementary school in grades one through six, and then grades seven to 10 would form another portion, and then finally grades 11 to 14. And at their heyday, there were approximately 32 of these nine 14 schools. And so under both of these approaches, the grades 13 to 14 eventually spun off and they created the community college system that we have today. Um, it's kind of ironic, actually, if we think about it, that um, that this model, these models were trying to reduce transitions, but they actually ended up creating an additional transition point, which would be the K-12 to, to two-year to four-year. Um, so this idea of merging high school and college kind of went underground for a while, but it did pop up occasionally. So there's a school called Simon's Rock that was started in 1964. Um, and that was the first residential early college for academic, and that was for academically gifted girls, and they started in grade 11. And this model evolved into Bard Early College, which actually is a network of schools. Of, of, I think they've got about 15 schools right now. And then in the early 1970s, Janet Lieberman at LaGuardia, Middle, uh, LaGuardia Community College wanted to adapt the early college model, but she wanted to do it for a different population. And she was particularly interested in the first generation immigrants that surrounded their college. Um, and she believed that these students could benefit from an accelerated curriculum instead of a remedial curriculum. And so that they would allow students to take college courses. And LaGuardia Middle College was born and they enrolled students mostly again in the latter years of high school. And that's been successful. And through support from the Ford Foundation, they've expanded that to about 25 schools. And then in the early 2000s came the re real game changers. So Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, um, they were seeking ways to improve high school education. And many of you may remember the, um, their effort to create multiple small schools, um, break large high schools into small, smaller schools. Um, the early college model was actually one of the models that they used and they were particularly interested in funding. And so, um, and they, they modified the model. They started students in grade nine, and they really focused on those students who are underrepresented in college. By the end of the initiative, there are about 200 around the country, um, and it actually has continued to grow even in the absence of funding. And so today, um, current estimates suggest that we've got about a thousand early college high schools and early college programs across the country. Here are some states with some of the highest participation rates. Um, it is important to note that when the modern early college model originated, most had the goal of preparing a student to transfer to a four-year, and the courses were focused primarily on earning that associate degree or transferable credit. But as the model's been evolving, there's been an increased emphasis as well on earning CTE credentials, so technical credentials that students can take directly into the workforce. So widespread. Excuse me. No, no problem. Widespread. So why do we see that? Why do we think this model is sticking around today when it didn't a hundred years ago? Um, 1940s, very di very different situation, right? So in the 1940s, you had less than half of the U.S. population had more than an eighth grade education. Less than five percent of the U.S. population had completed college, and there really wasn't any an economic imperative for post secondary education. You could get a great job without a high school diploma. Today, it's it is very different. Increasing expectations for college education, much more of that economic imperative. Um, 
And actually, some researchers have also argued that the early colleges have been able to tap into a component of the school choice initiative because this is um, an option for students to attend. All right, so what do these models actually look like? So what does this actually look like? Um, so I'm going to give kind of a general picture of what this model looks like at the national level, and then Drew's going to dive in depth into what it looks like at his, his own institution. So um, these are in many cases small schools of choice, or they are programs within schools um, and pathways. So we're here in Indiana today. Um, a lot of these have programs or pathways within individual schools. Drew is going to talk about a small school where the entire school is an early college. Um, these schools require really strong partnerships with post-secondary institutions. Um, they are often located on a college campus. Um, and many of these are partnered with um, community colleges because um, community colleges in some way are actually a little more nimble sometimes than our four-year institutions. Um, this, the early colleges serve students starting in grades nine, and they go through grade 12. Some of them go through grade 13. So some of these are five-year programs. For example, in Michigan, they're required to be five-year programs. These are not targeted at gifted students. So the goal here is to get students who are capable of doing college work, but who are historically underrepresented in college. So that might be first-generation students, low-income students, students who are members of racial or ethnic groups that are underrepresented in college. As I mentioned, the goal is to get a high school diploma and then two years of that college credit or that associate degree, depending on who the post-secondary partner is. Um, but it's really not just about dual enrollment. It's also really a comprehensive re-envisioning of the high school experience. Um, so for example, um, these schools pay attention to things like, um, like instruction and making sure that instruction, they pay attention to the high school courses. They obviously give students um, early access to college courses. Um, and then they pay attention to the experience of the adults in the school as well, um, trying to really create an ongoing learning environment for everyone. So I am now going to turn this over to Drew, who's going to talk about one of these who actually, uh, what, what one of these looks like. And I will say before Drew does this, that, um, that oftentimes we do get pushback from our more competitive four-year institutions about the fact that, oh, students, high school students can't really be successful in this environment. Well, NC State is um, one of the top two um, most competitive institutions, public institutions in the state of North Carolina. And um, they're also um, long-standing home to an early college. So we're going to hear about how, how that works in this particular setting. So Drew, I'm going to turn it over to you, and you just tell me when the when to move forward. Great. Thank you very much. So yes, um, I think that um, as we're looking at a number of the early colleges, um, at least in our county and Wake County, um, they are um, linked with community colleges, um, but we are um, we provide an opportunity to link with a four-year institution. And uh, and I'll go through and talk a little bit uh, in slides to come about uh, how successful our students have been. Um, and so I, I do think it's a model that works and is um, an area where there, um, I think, is a lot of potential for growth. So um, one of the first things I'd like to talk about uh, is kind of our mission, our vision, and our values, and some key different aspects of how we got started as an early college and what that looks like in practice. So one of the first things is um, when we began working with NC State, and as this model was coming up, uh, it was incredibly important to align values. So um, uh, as as we've talked about up to this point, uh, you are you are there's a combination between uh, the college and the high school, um, and and just because of how our systems are set up, uh, we are working at two bureau. We're working with two bureaucratic entities, um, and so uh, that alignment. A lot of work has to go into that alignment and making sure that what we're offering and what we're providing aligns with what the, the what the high school is offering and providing aligns with what the college um, is offering and providing. And we did that in two specific ways um, because we are at kind of the conjunction of both the College of Engineering at. NC State and the College of Education, we really sit like at a nexus point in between them, a, a sweet spot, you might say, that um, uh, we 
decided to, to embed into all of our programming, the engineering design process, and then the grand challenges of engineering, which are things that are focus points with the College of Engineering, College of Education. Um, and they're really guides. Um, they are not uh, where all of our students are going to go become teachers or going to go become engineers. They have a wide variety of different paths that they take, but they're guides that are most flexible. When we're talking about the engineering design process, um, that works. That's just a continuous improvement model. And so any, any profession, which are most professions, where you want to get into, where you want to improve what you're doing, um, that model is really important. And then the grand challenges of engineering, even though it is set up through, uh, you know, a national engineering organization. It is, um, it's cross-curricular. It really, it, it's, you're not ju just going to have engineers working to solve those problems. It's going to take um, everybody working together to solve those problems. So that's, that's um, kind of making sure as we were thinking about that and getting things going, that that alignment really worked and it's embedded in what we do at the high school. So as students begin taking classes at NC State, it's embedded in what they're doing. Um, we can go to the next slide. Um, uh, and you also heard this mentioned quite a bit, but I wanted to reiterate it, that uh, our purpose, part of our mission, vision, and values, our purpose is to uh, provide more opportunities to, for students who are traditionally underrepresented in STEM fields. We are Wake STEM, um, so we do have a STEM focus, um, and there are, um, there are people who are underrepresented in those fields, and how do we help bring them in and support them so that we become a pipeline, not just to NC State, but to other uh, major STEM institutions uh, in North Carolina and outside of North Carolina. So our main focus on how to do that is looking at first-generation college-going students. So our, we have a recruitment process. We recruit middle schoolers. So as the middle schoolers come up and are um, applying to uh, start with us in ninth grade, any student across the county can apply. And our application is set up so that the students write an essay, essay they take recommendations, uh, we look at their grades and state testing uh, or you know, high stakes testing, and then students have to score a 70 or higher. So we're not looking for students who are, are, are perfect in hitting every, um, uh, you know, making sure they're they're getting the highest score they possibly can. We are really looking at uh, kind of a, a minimum level because we want you to be able to be successful and and make it through at on our timeline because we do have to move things quite quickly to get students ready to take uh, classes at NC State. Um, but we know that if you're reaching that that score of a 70, then you're that we're going to work with you and you will be successful. Um, and then what we do is we take those two groups of apple we take the applicants and we put them into two groups so we have we put all of our first gen uh, first generation students in one pile and all of our non first generation students in another pile and our super superintendent who um, uh, two years ago um, set a, a new criteria so it, it had been 50 percent of our population the goal was to get to 50 percent to be first generation uh college going students that has now been bumped up to 70 percent so we are working very hard to recruit attract get out into communities let families know um, that we're an option um, and so you can see that we have really bumped up we're over 50 percent now and you can see the last three years um, we're getting over 60 percent um, of our student body being first generation college going you can see that 12th and 13th grade uh 13th um grade year where it's low and we've done some unpacking about what happened during that year and it really that was our our COVID application year. So we couldn't get out like we needed to. We couldn't get out into communi communities like we needed to. So I think that really also tells us that getting out into communities is, is a really important way to let people know about this opportunity. Go to the next slide. So, um, and part of, uh, you know, as we're looking at our purpose, um, you know, who we're working with, and then now we recognize we have to prepare our students. So our students, and I'll talk a little bit more about this later on, um, but our students start taking their college classes as juniors. So we have two years, the freshman and sophomore year, um, to really get them ready to attend NC State, which is a major institution and has very high expectations. And so there are a couple different ways that we decided to do that. First, we do project-based learning. So project-based learning is where we are uh, are are 
working on learning through doing, working on learning through um, completing projects, making sure that there's real world applications to what we're learning. Um, and so we are working on a model that goes wall to wall projects so that most of what students are learning are through projects. Um, and we look at it both at the content um, so that there are individual classes where they're working on projects, but it's also interdisciplinary. So every semester, our students are working on a project that combines all of their classes classes that they're working on. So that's a key piece that has helped prepare them, because it's not only helping prepare them uh, with the content that they need to know, but it is they're having to work with others, they're having to think deeply, all of those things which are incredibly important as they move uh, onto into college courses and college life. The second piece that we looked at was math, and we found very early on that what students struggle the most with um, at the college level was their math. Um, and so uh, we've done a number of different things to help support them, um, but we have all students take a high school math placement exam when they come in, and we and and we're in a, a I'm not sure if this is the way it is where you are, but where we are is that it's everybody's trying to get through math as quickly as possible. And so what we do is we have them take this high school math placement and have students potentially retake a class. So if they're coming in with our math one class and they may have a math one high school credit coming out of middle school, we have them re we can potentially have them retake that math one class if we're seeing holes or gaps in their learning. And the way that we sell it is, is that we're going to get you to be, be able to take math at NC State by your junior year. Um, but you got to go with our process and we and having holes in your learning doesn't matter how fast you go that's going to come back and bite you and parents have been um, open to that and been willing to work with us on doing that. Um, we also offer math classes each semester. Um, so that uh, students are working on math instead of taking one math class a year, they'll take two math classes a year, and then we created our own um, class to really help prepare them. It's called Topics and Calculus, and it helps, you know, as I talked about that wall-to-wall -wall projects, um, that is not necessarily always the way that math classes are taught at NC State, so we are building some capacity for them, for our students to be able to enter and be able to be successful in the math classes that uh, they will be taking. Go to the next slide. And the other piece that we can look at with press, uh, preparation, um, you can't really see this graph very well, but that's okay because it doesn't. The, the numbers are not super important. But we look at uh, what we call career and college readiness, and this has been called soft skills. Um, we're calling it durable skills now, but there are things like self monitoring, persistence, ownership, self advocacy, support, collaboration motivation, organization, time management, and communication. And so these are these are 10 skills, uh, 10 dispositions that we feel are incredibly important that students are in our skill in our school know and work on uh, for them to be successful in college and for them to be successful with their career. And so we have all of the students reflect and do a, a basically a, a, a self-reflection uh, on using a Likert scale to measure kind of where they think they fall between one and five on each of these skills. And then we have them set specific goals for the year. And then staff members meet with each of the students to review the goals and to, to think about what they are going to do to be able to meet their goal and help build a plan with that. Then they take it again in the middle of the year and we follow up with the students and then at the end of the year and then we reflect on how their work went and how their work um, kind of benefited or things they would do differently to meet the goals that they have. And so this is a critical component in preparation because um, what we found is that uh, often what um, hurts students the most going into college is not their their understanding of the content. Um, it's these durable skills or academic behaviors or things that they're missing um, that are incredibly important for them to be successful. Great example is every time we have a student who's struggling in a college class, um, the first question we always ask is, well, have you met and talked with the professor? And the answer is quite often no. And we're like, well, that's the first thing you need to do, that self-advocacy, going and, and reaching out and making sure you understand um, what supports are available um, and really teaching those skills is incredibly important for them to be successful. And so that's why we're building and working on those. Go to the next one. 
So what does this look like um, uh, for our program? So as I mentioned, we have ninth and 10th grade. They're working on projects. They're taking high school credits. I may not have mentioned that, but they're taking high school courses to get them set so that they can graduate, um, uh, graduate high school. Then we begin as juniors for them to start taking uh, college classes. So during their junior year, they can earn five to eight credit hours. So they'll be taking two to three high school classes a semester as a junior, and they'll be taking one introduction to college course, uh, which is created. And um, it's the only course that the students will take where it's only early college um, students in there. And then they will take a math course a semester. Um, we place the students in their math course um, based on their high school, how they did in their high school math class, the academic behaviors that they've shown, and then also NC State um, uh, requires a math placement exam. So we look very carefully at, at where those students are going and we place them in those classes. Then we support them through, uh, we have a weekly math uh, recitation course at the high school so that um, uh, all of our, say, our MA 111 students um, who are taking pre-calculus, they'll meet with uh, one of our math teachers that we have hired um, once a week um, for an hour and a half to go through practice problems, um, seeing about what's going on in the class, what they're learning, what they're struggling with, um, and, and really provide that specific guided support to make sure they're successful. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about college interims coming up for seniors, but all students are required to submit their, their college grades every three weeks. Go to the next slide. Okay, then for our senior year, um, students can take 12 to 24 credit hours. So that's a maximum of four college classes a semester, and they just take one high school class a semester with us. So we help register students. We have a university liaison who is employed by NC State and high school staff work with students to make sure that we register them in the correct classes. We've done, we do a ton of work um, up until their junior and senior years to help them really figure out what they want, what their intended major is, what career path they wanna take so that when they are taking classes at NC State, their courses that are really counting toward their, towards their general education program um, and that fit with maybe where they want to go, what school they want to go to, what college they want to go to, and what their major is. Um, and then we have check-ins with high school staff. Um, it's a little different than the recitation. These are for specific students who need, who've been identified, who need additional support, and they have required check-ins uh, with high school staff to make sure that we're keeping an eye on them, that uh, we're building plans to make make sure that they're getting the support they need or we're providing the support that they need. We work closely with um, businesses. Uh, Cengage is one business where we can provide tutoring through the high school for college courses. Um, and then also we require for our seniors, there's an internship, which can either be with a local business um, or uh, to do college research uh, with the university. And then, as I mentioned before, we have college interim. So every student's required every three weeks to, to screenshot their grades um, and then share them with me. Um, so um, part of, you know, you have two, as we mentioned earlier, there are two different systems. We have the Wake County Public School System and we have NC State, which are both large bureaucracies. And so to work in through and to be able to figure out exactly where kids are, are struggling, it's not going to work seamlessly. So you, we really did have to build and adjust and change ways to keep tabs on students so that um, kind of the, the less, the worded, the verbiage I use um, when I'm talking to parents or talking to students is what we provide is a um, uh, uh, college experience with a high school level of support. And so, um, yeah, our, our seniors and our super seniors certainly are feeling more like college students and they're, they're seeing themselves more as college students, which is great. Um, but there are certain things that are requirements and there are certain supports that we provide that we found are incredibly important for them to be successful. Go to the next slide. And then the next slide is just the super senior year, um, which is um, basically it's that uh, we talked about that 13th year uh, students um, put off graduating high school, even though they have the credits to graduate high school, to be able to um, attend NC State um, and basically uh, take a full college load. So they can take anywhere from 18 to 30 credit hours. Now, one thing I hadn't mentioned is all of these courses, all of the textbooks are all paid for by the state of North Carolina. So this is, um, and I think 
this is uh, basically a free college so that they're able to um, amass these credits and not and not be saddled with any debt. So they're taking five college courses, um, and they're taking one high school class a semester. Um, in this case, that high school class is uh, either the inter internship the first semester, or and we offer a seminar um, on project management, and that would be second semester. These students still are having to um, turn in their college interims, um, and we still have check-ins for, for specific students who um, potentially need that, but they're not as many. They're very few, they're very few super seniors um, who come back in um, and uh, need check-ins. For our super seniors, it's not mandatory that they have to come back for their super senior year, so we do have seniors that decide to graduate after four years, um, and typically we have about half of our students decide to come back after their super senior. So go on to the next slide. So what are the results? Like, is this working or not? Um, so hopefully y'all can see this. Um, uh, basically, this, this is our cumulative GPA of all of our students over time. And this is, uh, so every student, as the students have taken, every student who's enrolled and taking NC State classes this is their average GPA. So you can see starting when we first started taking, when we first had kids, um, students taking classes at NC State, well, we, they were averaging about a 2.8 um, uh, cumulative GPA. And we've adjusted and made changes, especially around math and how to support students. And you can see that general trend going up. So that now this past semester, we our average GPA was at 3.58. And we're really proud of that because our students are not, uh, apart from the intro to to college class, our students are taking the classes that all other um, freshmen and sophomores are taking, and they're taking, uh, in some in some instances, very difficult classes. Um, you know, engineering calculus. Uh, you know, multiple years of engineering calculus. Uh, they're taking physics. They're taking chemistry. They're taking biology. They're taking uh, all of the things, like I said, that a, a normal freshman or sophomore would be taking, and they're. Um, they're outperforming the general population at NC State. So our, and Dr. Horn can probably speak to, maybe speak to this a little bit better, but uh, I'm pretty confident that a th that the average student in NC State does not have a 3.58. So I think the work that we're doing around that is really meeting the needs of our students. Okay, next slide. Uh, and then I also think it's important to look at um, uh, our subgroups as well. So as you can see that um, we have we have a very diverse population at our school. Um, and you can see that across the board, the, the green is this past spring, but you can see that our students are performing pretty similar at the same levels. They're all ha having a uh, pretty high above, I think, 3.3 for, for multi-racial, um, um, and that's a really small number of students um, that we have, um, but everyone else is is close to 3.5 or above, so our students are, um, it doesn't, it, it does not matter um, your race or ethnicity um, at Wake STEM, you are, you are being successful and being successful at a similar clip. Excellent. Um, so uh, there are a couple of different things, opportunities that I wanted to share uh, before we take your questions, but just to show you kind of how the work with NC State has opened more doors for students um, and things as you're thinking about from, um, from a, a collegiate point of view, what that could look like. Um, but so just a, a couple of examples. Um, we had, uh, uh, we were working with the College of Engineering and um, they brought the idea of our students taking Engineering 102 which is focused on the grand challenges and it's open to, um, to all NC State students. So we said, boy, that would be a great opportunity since our students our students at Wake STEM have had so much experience with the grand uh, challenge of the engineering program. Um, our students went in there, did so well. We had a group, um, uh, they're like 800, um, 800 students taking these classes. Um, and there were, I think, like 300 or 400 pre different presentations that kind of culminating activity that the students did, uh, posters that they made. And there were six different groups, um, six different areas in which you could submit your poster. And one of our one of our groups won one of those areas. So these are engineering, mainly engineering students, not all, but mainly engineering students. And there was just such a positive feedback from 
the professors who taught our students and who worked with our students that we were able to open up Engineering 101. And don't ask me why Engineering 102 comes before Engineering 101. I don't know, but um, they opened up Engineering 101, which are classes that are only open to engineering students. And so we got a smaller number, 10, uh, 10 or 12 of our students into that Engineering 101 class because of how well our students did in Engineering 102. Other pieces that we have is that uh, NC State offers a Grand Challenge Scholars Program, um, which is a um, global program uh, for schools with engineering programs um, or colleges with engineering programs. And so we right now have four students this summer who are doing research with um, uh, engineering professors and engineering grad students. They're doing hands-on research with them and are part of the Grand Challenge Scholars Program, uh, even though they're still high schoolers. So they're just some incredible opportunities there. And then opportunities for NC State is that our students are not guaranteed admission into NC State, um, but we are providing a pipeline to increase diversity uh, of the College of Engineering and other schools and colleges at NC State. So it is, there is, um, uh, NC State uh, gets to see how our students perform. And we have a very diverse, as I said, a diverse population and, um, and students uh, quite often get into NC State and are able to matriculate there and do very well there. And so we're really proud of that. So that's um, pretty much Wake, Wake STEM in a nutshell, um, but I'd love to be able to take any questions that you might have, or if you have any um, thoughts or anything you'd like to share. Drew, there was a question in um, in the chat that um, Erica asked about, is there a minimum GPA requirement to participate? That, that's a great question. So there is not a minimum GPA requirement to get into um, a Wake STEM because we're coming off of middle schoolers. But to be able to participate in, uh, in NC State classes, you have to have a weighted um, high school GPA of a 3.0. Um, and so uh, for the most part, we may have um, one um, very rarely we'll have two, um, but there are typically very few students who are not able to participate at, at, at NC State classes. But there is a, um, you have to show us that you have the ability to um, do, be proficient, do well at the high school level before we let you take classes at NC State. Um, students also have to maintain a 2.0 um, uh, college GPA. So if they fall below a 2.0 college GPA, they're put on academic probation and they can't take college classes that next semester. But then um, if they are able to get everything in order, then they can begin taking it the following semester after that. Um, thank you. So, and yeah. then Penn oh. State, <laughs> um, Harrisburg was asking if our state does not provide the funding, um, what are the suggestions for funding this type of initiative? <laughs> I think that's a little bit out of my uh, my realm of expertise. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a great question. And um, I will say that it is challenging. Most of the states where you've seen significant expansion, the state is funding dual enrollment. Um, there are in... Um, there are some universities and colleges that have just absorbed the cost of it or the district is willing to pay for it. Um, it's those are much more challenging situations and they do require a lot of um, sort of um, commitment on behalf of the partnering institutions to make that sort of funding available. So the colleges might cut a deal for tuition and things like that. Um, we do have some private institutions that actually I think waive tuition for them because they see the long-term benefits of it. But um, it, it is, I agree, much easier to implement when the, when the, the state is providing the funding. So just to give you a sense of, of how much it costs, um, we have, um, we're a very small school, so we're at 262 students, and we have 100 and, 130 of those taking college classes, so there's like 330 classes, and typical is, is what we take a semester, um, and uh, I think that the, the last, you know, how much we wrote a year was like $400,000. Um, for classes at NC State. Um, and then we have, we spend probably another um, $50,000 a year on textbooks. So, um, uh, so I, I, I would say for a school our size, uh, probably a good estimate is about $500,000 um, 
a year to keep the program going. Um, and that's that's just from the, um, uh, we also get support from our, our um, county, um, the magnet program, we fit under a magnet model. And so they provide additional um, staffing to allow us to uh, maintain small class sizes. So there, there is, it is a financial, um, there's, you know, it, it's expensive, but it is so worth it. Um, Drew, there's a question in the chat. What do you think is the greatest contributor to the student success? So I'm going to um, uh, cop out on this and not pick one. I'm going to pick two um, <laughs> because you know, it, it, it's too hard for me to choose, but I think it's twofold. I think the uh, level of rigor uh, with our project-based learning that we kind of uh, ingrain in students and our teachers are just uh, amazing at writing and doing and making sure it happens on a daily basis. Those first two years um, and are the support that the teachers provide and the level of rigor. So like they set an incredibly high bar, but then they provide scaffolding to be able to sure they that students meet that bar. It, we would not be successful without that happening. Um, and then the second component is the level of support we provide once they go to to college. So all of the things that I talked about, the things, the recitation classes, um, the um, support, the academic support, meeting, checking in with them, uh, we get them to the point so they can be successful, but then we hold their hand to make sure they don't veer off the path. And I think those two things are incredibly important. Without one, without the other, uh, you're not going to have the success we've had, but really combining them both is why we've, we've done what we've been able to do. So um, I am actually, we're going to um, not do the breakout discussions now, given the, um, the time, and there's some other information that we want to share, and I think we're going to get at, to the answers of some of your questions that it looks like are coming in the chat. So um, um, so basically, we have this model, that, and that Drew's been talking about, done an excellent job explaining what it looks like. Hopefully, you really got a flavor of the experience. So the question is, does this really work? Is it possible to do this? And so the next section is going to describe some findings from current research. And I want to begin with the story of a student. So Jaleesa is an early college student who was featured in our book. Um, she had many challenges stacked against her. She was originally raised by her grandmother with her parents out of the picture. When her grandmother began to go blind, she ended up living with an aunt in an area with poor schools. She was constantly getting in trouble at school, spending a lot of time in ISS, um, really mostly because she was bored. Um, she was placed in gifted programming, but was often the only African-American student in the class. Um, and then when she was getting ready to enter high school, she applied and got into the early college at the local HBCU. Um, she attended the early college, earning over 60 transferable credits by the time she graduated. Um, she transferred to another college um, where she actually got a full ride um, because of um, her financial need. Uh, life, I will say life was not easy for her. And she actually, she, my favorite quote was, she said, life happens. Um, and it happened to me a lot, um, but she needed to end up, up needing to take some time off. Um, so she wasn't finishing on time, but her early college counselor and her early college friends kept in touch and inspired her and she went back and she has finished her degree and now has a job that she loves. Um, and her story isn't really very atypical for early college students, but I'm gonna show you some about the data. So we, as well as some other researchers have conducted several rigorous high quality studies of the impact of early colleges. Two of these studies compare results for early college students who applied to attend the early college. So remember, these are schools of choice. Um, they went through a lottery process and they, um, and they were randomly selected to attend. And then we compare it to students who went through the lottery and were randomly selected not to attend. So it's really an apples to apples comparison. Um, we've also looked at all the early colleges in North Carolina and compare outcomes for non-early college students. Um, compare outcomes for students participating in the early college with students who weren't, weren't in the early college but have similar background characteristics. And all of these studies actually have remarkably consistent findings. Um, we have positive income impacts on a host of student outcomes. So at the high school level, we've seen that early college students have better attendance, lower suspensions, um, slightly higher graduation rates, and much higher numbers of college credits earned in high school when we, again, compare them to students who applied to the early college went through the lottery and were randomly not selected to attend and ended up usually going to the regular high school in the district. 
We also found compared to our control group that early college students were more likely to enroll in college, more likely to earn a post-secondary credential. They had a higher percentage of advanced credits and they also graduated more quickly, um, receiving their associate degree in two years less time and their bachelor's in half a year. Um, and these students also ended up with less debt. So I'm gonna share a few slides around some specific data points. So this slide, um, presents findings from North Carolina's early college model. That's that small standalone, like the one that um, Drew's just been describing. So these are, um, we compared results for those students who enrolled in early college in ninth grade and compared them to non-participants adjusting for um, background characteristics. And then we look at their impact by credentials. And as we can see, when we look at the impact on earning any credential by six years after high school, there's a large statistically significant impact. Um, there's a small positive impact when we break on earning a diploma. So we're breaking out those credentials by three different um, specific credentials. So the certificate or diploma are those more technical credentials. And we see that there's a small positive impact on those. Remember, many of these schools started emphasizing the associate degree or the two years of transferable credit. Um, but more schools have actually started moving in that direction and are providing um, CTE or other credentials. Um, huge, ginormous, which that's a that's an official statistical term, ginormous impact on associate degree attainment. We see about seven times as, or six times as many students are getting their associate degree within three years past high school and a small or a statistically significant positive five percentage point impact on earning a bachelor's degree. And our results are larger for our economically disadvantaged students. So our economically disadvantaged students are actually the ones that are benefiting most from this model. Um, how do students do after they leave the early college? So we, we were able to look at this for students who enrolled in the UNC system. That was the only, um, we only had data for those particular ones. What we see is cumulative GPAs. Um, so the GPAs are basically the same. So this is, um, these aren't as impressive as Drew's GPAs as he was showing. This is what happens after they leave. And this is across all the institutions. Um, so statistically significantly higher share of credits and advanced courses, slightly less likely to switch majors, but that's not statistically significant. And we see that they're saving money, that they're graduating with less debt. And that's done, that's basically by um, because they're graduating more quickly. And then we have some information about cost and benefits. So um, when we think about the cost, we have to remember that this is high school and college happening at the same time. So it's not necessarily fair to compare the cost of the early college to a cost of a regular high school. Um, we think about what it costs to earn a diploma and a post-secondary credential. And so when we look at the route, when we look at what it costs to earn a high school diploma and a post-secondary credential under the early college route versus the other route, versus the regular traditional route, the cost, it costs society. So it costs the taxpayers generally about the same or less for students to earn a high school diploma and that post-secondary credential. It costs students a lot less because as Drew was saying, it's free for them, those college credits that they earn in, a, in the two year, um, I'm sorry, in the early college, those, those um, credits are free. Um, people have done return on investment analyses, basically looking at the benefits to society um, so um, there's lots of benefits, you know, education will result in increased income and as a result, increased taxes paid um, to paid back to the state, um, reduced cost in healthcare, reduced cost in incarceration, things like that. Um, when people take all of that into account, they see that for every dollar invested in the early college model, um, you can expect $15 in returns or up to $17 in returns. So very large um, returns on investment. So I'm going to now um, take a minute and turn it over to um, Aaron, who's going to talk about what it is um, to have the early college from the um, from the four year side. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, because a lot of times it could be like, so <laughs> what does NC State get besides um, a bunch of minors on campus, as well as um, you know some tuition, right? Um, but really for us. It, it comes down, I think it's really important just essentially being part of this conference as well, right? And it's providing access, right? NC State is a land grant institution in North Carolina. Um, it is one of the largest in our state, um, if not the largest. Uh, and so we are here to serve the people of North Carolina. And for us, the, the area of 
first generation college students and students who are underrepresented being a predominantly white institution, providing access um, in multiple pathways. And so we have partnerships with community colleges to allow those transfer pathways. Um, but this is another way for us to, to build that capacity within our high school students so that they can be successful in college. NC State is a difficult institution. I mean, we're not necessarily high selective. Um, we we ex, you know accept about 47% of our applicants, but we get 35,000 applications for first year students at NC State. And our freshman class is about 5,000 students. Um, and so while we accept a lot, the ones that actually choose to come to us is smaller. Um, and so, and 25% of our first generation or our first year students are first generation students. And so one of the things that we on our campus have done is trying to build in a lot of supports, especially for our first generation college students. Um, and so that they can be successful on our campus. So as we kind of embarked on this process, some of the things that we've tackled, whether it was at the beginning um, or whether it was oh no, we need to do that after as we were already kind of sailing the ship through. Um, but thinking about who would be on the team. So when the idea was first brought up for thinking about a partnership between Wake County Public Schools, which is one of the top five school districts as far as size goes in the country, um, and NC State University, which has um, 36,000 plus students for a very large institution as well, as Drew mentioned, kind of two very separate bureaucratic um, institutions. And so thinking about who are those stakeholders that are gonna come to the table, having to have both the decision makers as well as the doers um, as part of that relationship, because there's a lot of work and there was a lot of heavy lifting, but there were also a lot of folks in high roles that needed to say, to sign off on these things, right? So thinking about our provost, thinking about um, you know the, the office of having minors on campus, thinking about our chancellor, thinking about the state or the district superintendent um, and the principal. And so thinking about who are those folks that are coming around the table to build this program, but then also having a designated point person at each of those entities so that they were the ones kind of coalescing around what are these planning meetings going to look like? Um, what are going to be our goals as we go through there? Because it, it didn't have, right, like Wake STEM Early College was developed as part of this partnership. It wasn't taking a high school that was already in existence and combining it with NC State. And so it was really trying to develop that, but having a point person at each of those um, institutions. And Julie, you kind of laughed when I said, as a four-year institution, the um, policies and procedures around having minors on campus is a big deal. Um, as, as Drew mentioned, these students, see themselves as college students. We have many faculty members who actually don't know which students in their class are early college students. Um, because as Drew mentioned already, they perform at a very high level. So there's not a lot of differentiation there, um, but they're still minors on campus. And so how do we make sure that our systems and structures on campus are protecting those students um, and keeping them safe while they're also on our campus um, and following all of our policies that we have around that? One of the things that we've started to tackle lately um, is providing access to the systems and structures that are available um, on our campus. So for example, our student information system, um, that's why Wake STEM had to kind of come up with this process of having students screenshot their grades and submit them every three weeks. Because um, as we developed this partnership, one of the things that we didn't think about was allowing the administration at Wake STEM Early College to have access to our student information system so that those they could stay on top of well as well about how their candidate or how their students are doing. Sorry, I'm talking teacher prep, um, but how their students are doing and thinking of their coursework. And so um, one of the things we're working on right now is uh, allowing Drew and his leadership team to have the ability to go into our student information system. We have we currently have them all as zero pay employees for our institution. So they have access to all of the resources and tools that are on our campus, um, including the library systems um, and, and whatnot, but they are able to go in and actually see their early college students. This early college students on our campus are actually listed as what we consider not NDS or non-degree seeking students. Um, however, we were able to create a special um, sub plan code under that designation, because NDS could be anybody from post-baccalaureate studies to 
somebody who just wants to take a course because they're in Raleigh for the summer and they're going to transfer it back to their institution. Um, anybody just not enrolled in a regular degree program. And so we were able to create that special, special designation within our student information system so that I, as the university person, can go in and see how all of the early college students are doing. Have all of the early college students registered for classes? Um, are we, we ran into an issue last time where a couple of students registered late. And so being able to kind of track down because they were going to cancel their schedules. Well, these, unless they paid it the minute they registered, well, these students don't pay tuition. So how do we kind of work within and around the structures that are typical for our university that let's be honest, our financial aid office hadn't really thought about <laughs> how does that look when a student registers late and they've got to pay in order for their schedule to, to stick but they don't pay tuition. Um, and so just kind of navigating that and knowing the who to talk to um, along those processes. And then the ongoing communication between leadership and advising. Um, Drew mentioned, we do have a university liaison um, that is employed by my office, um, works in my office. We as a team meet weekly, um, both the university liaison, myself, um, Drew, and then um, typically the school count, the head of the school guidance school counseling um, within his school. We meet to talk about any student concerns, um, what kind of issues or barriers are going on, those types of things, because you've got to have that ongoing structure in place for communication to be happening, because it could easily, there are lots of things going on at the high school, there are lots of things going on at a four-year institution, and um, sometimes it can fall to the back burner unless you make that a priority. So, um, so some things for us to consider as we went through this. Next slide. Um, so as we think about planning, you know, scheduling has been a, a huge one. And so um, with advising, we meet with Drew and his team because they have set times of the times they're taking classes on the high school schedule, especially for the juniors and the seniors. And so for us navigating and balancing, they can be on campus during these times based on their structure, their course schedule at the high school. So what courses can we find that would fit within that, that system? Um, also, we've worked on modifying as we've gone and looking at our intro to the college course that um, our early college liaison teaches and thinking about listening to the early college staff that are the high school staff and saying, well, what do these students need? What's the best time? Where should we plan to teach this class? Right. And so next we're moving forward to exploring sometimes the course may be taught on their campus and sometimes it may be taught on our campus and kind of working with the students on that so that it meets the needs of Wake STEM and their students and staff, as well as meeting the outcomes that are needed for us at the institution. And so being flexible where we can be flexible, um, because we know we can't be flexible in every area, right? Um, thinking about academics, Drew's already talked about student support. I think student support and focus that focus on student success um, is a huge element of both sides of that partnership, because our ultimate goal is that we want these students to be successful, whether they come to NC State or not. Um, I would say, well, what, about 50% Drew um, typically want to come to NC State. Um, a lot of them have aspirations for many other schools, but we work with them on kind of demystifying that whole process um, and really exposing the systems of higher ed that may not be transparent, especially to first generation going student, um, college going students. And so um, focusing on that academic success, being very clear about the expectations within college and college work. Um, and then what happens if you aren't meeting those academic expectations within that? Talked about instruction a little bit with our early college, um, thinking about what are those outcomes that help, again, working and co-planning that course with the Wake STEM early college faculty and thinking about what those students need um, as they are thinking about the transition. So we, we know how to transition students who are first year college students or transfer students from a community college, but really thinking about developmentally, what do 11th graders need as they are transitioning to that college and making sure that our college success course, because when the original iteration of the Wake STEM early college that introduction to college course, they were taking over in our, our DASA, which is our Department of Academic Student Affairs, which is where every first year student takes their intro to college course. Well, they were designing those courses for traditional freshmen or transfer students, not for high school juniors that were coming to college campus. And so that's where we really had to kind of pull that in 
and talk about, but what do these students need as we go through that process? Um, student support we've talked about and fees as well. Um, that's one of the things we haven't, we've worked out the fee structure, but again, providing access to systems. So that takes kind of me going down and sitting down and going through our system and pulling a roster of all of our students. And again, thinking about ways that we can try to ease that communication piece by providing access to our systems that the school district may need. Um, and then also where we're going next is thinking about program assessment. Um, we have actually hired a graduate student um, this coming for this coming academic year to think about what um, types of data elements do we want as a university to explore around the success of these students and where they go and how it, we can use that to go then inform back into our programs for um, for improvement. So next slide. Yeah, like I said, student success. I, I was kind of focusing on that. All of these students have access to any of the resources that are available on NC State's campus. Um, we do, we have the early college liaison and that's usually the person that's making those connections. So the students are meeting with, in the junior year, like I said, they're teaching that introduction to college course. So the junior 11th grade students are meeting with the liaison every week through that course. Um, the seniors have to schedule at least three meetings a semester with that liaison where they are checking in, talking about how things are going. Have you been going to office hours? Again, thinking about a lot of those kind of self-advocacy skills on a college campus that are very different when you think about being in a high school. Um, also providing access to tutoring. So Wake STEM does an amazing job with their um, math tutoring and thinking about Cengage, but then also on our campus, we have access to resources. Being a college of education, while I think we may have only had two students who have gone through Wake STEM who actually decided they wanted to be teachers, that's not why the College of Education is part of this partnership. The College of Education is part of this partnership because the learning of K-12 students is important to our College of Education. And so whether they choose to be educators or not, we want to help grow and develop students. And so with tutoring this year, our, um, our students who are studying to be secondary math educators actually started a tutoring center in our college that the Wake STEM early college students had access to. Um, and the students that participated spoke very highly of it. So again, it's another layer of support where their students are getting that support, as well as our students are getting experience working with high school students through that math. Um, and then on-campus resources, whether it's through the libraries, um, through you know the different student services around campus, um, the, our students have access to those. So that's it's kind of a, a comprehensive way of supporting the students as they are making that transition to college. Um, so yeah, I think that's my last slide. Is that it? Yeah. Yeah, Ned, thank you, Erin. So I think basically we want to put this all together and I know we're down to our last couple minutes here. And, um, so really what we've argued today, expanding access to post-secondary education is critical for today's economy. Too many students are shut out. Early colleges are really this test case about whether we can combine high school and college, and they're targeted at underrepresented populations. And results show that students can do well in this setting, and we don't, we're not really seeing a downside to it. And it certainly seems to be cost effective. So the question is kind of like, why, why not? Why, why can't we do more of this? And so I think what we would encourage um, you to do is, and we're out of time here, but um, think about the implications of this for your work. So if you don't have one, could you envision partnering with a district to create one? And if, even if you can't envision hosting one, um, lots of students are going to be coming to you with substantial college credits, even to your degrees. How will your institution handle these students? And are there things that you'll need to do differently? And, um, and then also, there are a lot of things that the early colleges are doing well around supports and things like that. How can we, how can we learn from that? So I'm going to um, wrap up in the last minute here and just share some resources with you all. Um, so the Early College Research Center, if you're interested in more research about early college, please go to this research center. This is intended to be kind of a one-stop shop for um, a web page for you about resources related to early college. We're not focused, we're focusing mostly on the research, but we do connect you to organizations that are also doing implementation. Um, feel free to check out the book and then feel free to reach out to any of us. Our email addresses are there. So thank you very much for your for your participation and attendance.
Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julie, Drew, and Aaron. This was fantastic. I really appreciate your time and you timed it perfectly to end at four Eastern time. Appreciate everybody's participation and we will, we're going to team time next.